Revelation 7. And um, actually, this is, I'm going I'm to fit this in here into Revelation 7. We're going to look at the, the purpose. And I've taught this before uh, here. Um, yeah, not too long ago, as a matter of, well, I say not too long ago. That was two chapters ago, so that would have been, what, 2016 election, somewhere around in there. But the purpose in this case of being sealed in Revelation 5, we have the sealed book. <clears throat> I saw on the right hand of him uh, that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And in Revelation 7, then um, I think the purpose of the book being unsealed has everything to do said that uh, when one of the angels sounded their trumpet, it was proof that there was no women in heaven. And somebody told me, I think it's probably Warren Livingston or somebody, says proof there's no women in heaven. I said, why is that? He said, well, it says when the trumpet sounded, there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And <clears throat> it wasn't my joke. That's a, that's a Warren Livingston, something like that. Anyway, but I think this fits in with the purpose of the seven sealed book. Sealed. Open it to who it really is. In Remember, Revelation is unsealed. The angel told uh, John, seal not the sayings of this book. But Daniel was told specifically, seal up the sayings. And uh, Daniel, especially in the last chapters, is very, very difficult to understand. Just the, the language of it is difficult to follow. And, um, or at least that's what I found. And my belief is that it will not be, its meaning will not be unsealed uh, until this book is unsealed. Uh, here in Revelation 6, 7, 8, uh, 6 and 7, <clears throat> and so on. Now, just for a, a little glimpse, uh, and I taught this down in uh, Fort Smith, uh, because some of them were asking if there's any significance Queen Elizabeth um, and the, you know, the coming kingdom of the third look I saw Philip Edward George. It's Philip. After King Arthur, father, King George the sixth, I believe. He was Elizabeth's father. But anyway, um, I mentioned this down in Arkansas. Why does the monarchy in England There's no doubt about it. We were, a, we were the colonies of England and thus under the monarchy of King George III. Not a nice guy. King George VI was a pretty good guy. Um, he's the one that country through World War II. Um, 
But anyway, King George III was not a good king, especially to his colonies, his subjects over here. And of course, we uh, had the revolution. There, there was a lack of Bibles in America uh, right after the war. And somebody in Congress wanted the authority to purchase Bibles from England. He hadn't really set up shop in this country. And um, I think Congress, the British, and a, a printing place was set up, um, what they call a stationer back then. It's where we get the word stationary. And um, then Congress authorized the publication, the first American Bible, and it was first because. President Washington wanted to make sure that every soldier in America had a copy of God's Word. You don't see that anymore, but that's how it was back then. But anyway, going all the way back to 1611, when King James of England of the Bible that he wanted translated, Bible. It was authorized. The king of England is the head of England and the church of and territories all over the world. And back colonies everywhere, which meant that they went everywhere. Writing English, taking tea, uh, playing football, and playing cricket. All soccer. He did. He authorized. So now, over the. James is one of God because it's the only how God United Kingdom and its territory. There is no copy. Or in the case of the Bible search software that we have. To use the King James Bible, it's absolutely free. It's free of copyright. It's free of any legal restriction. And we can publish it. We can put it in software. We can put it in our bulletins. I can write books and put them in there. on it or they cutting in and out JR 
Microphone cutting in and out. Let me do this. All right. So anyway, with him putting it under the crown, it means that as long as there is a monarch in the United Kingdom, doesn't matter if it's male or female, the King's Bible, the authorized Bible, cannot be altered in any way except by the authority of the crown. And now this is important. Um, I forgot what king it was in the late 1800s that had it in his mind to update the authorized Bible. So what he did was he hired two British scholars named Westcott and Hort. And those two guys were absolute devils. The king wanted them to update the English to remove things like these and thous and just sort of update the language with the current language of the English world. What West Cotton Hort did was something completely different. They decided not to just update the English. They decided to update, quote unquote, the entire Bible, which means they're the first ones who really stepped outside of the Greek texts that the King James Bible was translated from and go with these, number one, the Vatican Greek text. That tells you something there. The Greek text from Mount Sinai, a monastery, a Greek Orthodox in monastery in Egypt, Mount Sinai, Egypt, um, was where a man by the name of Tischendorf found this copy of the Greek New Testament. And he reckoned it from around 300 A.D. The Vatican's copy is from around 300 A.D. But when you compare the two, just in the four Gospels alone, they disagree with each other over 60,000 times. There's no, it's like, it, it's like the two witnesses that they brought to witness against Jesus. And what did the Bible say? Their witness agreed not with each other. And that's the two Greek manuscripts that, that Westcott and Hort used. And their, and their witness didn't agree with each other on just the four Gospels alone. But that was the Greek text that they used. And their revised, since they couldn't, they couldn't use that to replace the authorized Bible because they'd gone so far afield in retranslating it because like in Isaiah 9 in our Bible it says behold a virgin shall conceive right that's a prophecy of Mary but in the revised Bible they said behold a young woman shall conceive that's completely different than a virgin and so it was never it was never used to replace the authorized Bible. They just came up with a completely different translation called the Revised Standard Version. Uh, and then later on, the two universities there in England, Oxford and Cambridge universities, they're the ones who actually hold the, the copyright and the, and the licensing of the King James Bible in the United Kingdom. Meaning if you wanted to print Bibles, you have to get permission from Oxford or Cambridge in order to do it. Um, but you certainly can't make any changes to it. So then, several years ago, um, a group of sodomites were going to sue Cambridge and Oxford to get the authorized Bible changed to take the word sodomite out of the Bible. They didn't like that word, said it made them look bad. Yeah. Them holding hands makes them look bad. But anyway, when they sued, they lost the case. 
for one reason. They said, neither Cambridge nor Oxford nor this court has any authorization to alter the Bible because it's under the supervision and authority of the crown of England. And only the king or the queen has the right to change it. What is, I think it's Proverbs, what does it say? Where the words of a king is, there's power. Somebody say amen. While all of the monarchies, or most of them, have fallen in Europe, and you have, now have all of these nations in Europe becoming republics, Britain is one of the few nations still left in Europe that has retained its monarchy. And I think God has had something to do with that. All right, now, Revelation 7. Come on in, young man. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed, there it is again, who has sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. Uh, something I'll point out real quick, since I count things. You have, in verse 1, the four angels at the four corners, holding the four winds. And then it mentions the four angels again, down in verse 2. Four times these four angels are mentioned, but also four times in these four verses, the word seal or sealed is mentioned exactly four times. Has to do with the gospel. This is the time when the veil that is over Moses' face, when the Jews read the Old Testament, that veil is going to be lifted and they're going to see who's behind there for the first time ever. And they're going to see Jesus Christ, the risen King of kings and Lord of lords. And the Holy Ghost is going to seal them then with that Holy Spirit of promise. So I was looking at this word a few years ago and I just did a, a personal study on the word seal. And I really enjoyed what I was looking at. Again, it's been a while since we were in Revelation 5, but I'm going to run through this again now. The first time we looked at the book that was sealed. Now we're going to take these same ideas and look at these people that are sealed. In fact, uh, very quickly, and I probably have this in my notes, but turn to um, Ephesians. Chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 12, Ephesians 1, 12. Even though Jesus came, was born as a Jew from the tribe of Judah, came to his own people, Israel, but his own received him not. He came to his own, but his own received him not, the Bible says. So he comes to Israel first. And Paul says that often. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek, meaning the Gentile. He goes to the Jews. For the most part, they don't accept it. And to this day, won't accept it. It's almost like the Jews in their mind have it that Jesus was a Gentile Messiah, a Gentile Savior. But he was Jewish. He was as Jewish. In fact, he was more Jewish than they were because he actually kept the law. Amen. Didn't serve other gods like them and their forefathers did. <clears throat> but anyway, in verse 12, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That makes us... Technically, the firstborn, even though we're the second group 
that Christ sends the gospel to, we're the first to believe it. Okay? Because at some point, I've mentioned this before, Paul quit going to the synagogues. He gave up. He said, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm, I'm just, when I go into a town, I'm going to quit arguing with the Jews. Because obviously, every place I go, they try to have me killed. And you know, you can only put up with being killed so many times. And then you just say, I don't want to be killed anymore. So he starts preaching to the Gentiles and Gentiles love it. Verse 13. And this is where we are sealed. In whom ye also trusted, meaning Christ, after that you heard the word of truth, which means the Bible, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, if you were ever looking for a verse that proves that you cannot be baptized, nor receive the Holy Ghost, nor be saved as an infant, it's Ephesians 1.13. Because what's the qualification to be sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit? You got to believe. And babies can't believe. They can't. There's nothing. They don't have the mind for it. They don't have, they don't have, they haven't attained the knowledge yet. So you believe first, you trust the word of truth, the gospel. After you believe, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. And I use this phrase, earnest money, because we all understand that, don't we? Earnest money. When you're going to buy something from somebody or sell something to somebody or you're going to rent something from somebody and they say, well, I want to deposit on it. Uh, that means you're going to bring it back when you're done. Uh, then you give them your uh, you give them a check for three hundred dollars or five hundred dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever. I remember going from my dormitory room out in Oklahoma about four miles down the road to work at the shoe store I worked at. And on my way there, a block away from the shoe store, I stopped this little gas station I always stopped at to get gas. Didn't have any gas and I wasn't going to get much because I didn't have much money. So I put, this sounds silly now, but I put five dollars worth of gas in there. That was 1985, four, five, 1984, 85, you know, when gas cost 70 cents a gallon. And $5 got you half a tank or better. And so I go inside and I reach for my wallet and I open it up and I didn't have any money. And I'm going, I've already filled $5 worth. I don't know what to do. So I went in and I told the guys, I said, look, I go to... Hillsdale College down here, they knew it. I said, I work at this shoe store right over here. They could see it. And I said, honest, I've got the money. I thought I had it in my wallet. I don't have it. I don't know what to do. And they said, do you have a driver's license? I said, yeah, leave us your license. Well, that was my earnest. So I pulled out my driver's license. Here's the funny thing. My license expired. My first driver's license expired while I was out in college. So mom got me an out-of-state driver's license. And it says on there, valid without photo. I didn't have my picture on it. Remember that? Valid without photo. So I, <laughs> he almost didn't take it. I said, really, that's who I am. So he kept my driver's license. And he said, when you get your $5, bring it to me and I'll give you your license back. So right after work, uh, the next day, I go back down there, $5. I said, can I have my license back? Yeah. That was my earnest that I absolutely was going to come back, give them their $5 so I get my driver's license back. Because my driver's license is worth more than $5, is it not? Because if you get turned, pulled in and you don't have it, it's going to be more than $5. So that's what an earnest is. And what God has done with us, he's put 
the Holy Spirit in us, which then shows us every day that God is faithful. And by putting his spirit in us, he's putting his word in us. So that even if you don't have a Bible in front of you, the Holy Ghost can still bring scripture to mind and say, God is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's earnest. Amen. That's him showing us that if he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, he means it. Amen. So, uh, back to Revelation 7. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Israel, these tribes are going to be sealed. The number of them is 144,000, verse 4. And again, we have uh, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, tribe of Joseph. He was the 11th born. Benjamin was the 12th born. Uh, we're sealed 12,000. And then it stops there. And then we have the Gentiles from verse 9 on through 17. So what is the biblical significance of the seal? Number one, seals are used by governments. Um, the other day, I was watching uh, on YouTube after, this, after the service the other night, I think it was uh, Tuesday, when they had the first official pronouncement or first official act of declaring Charles Edward Arthur, or Charles Philip Arthur George to be King Charles III. And that was in what's called the Privy Council and used to be privy. It used to be private, but, you know, it's the television age. So they allowed cameras in there and a lot more people than they used to. It used to be just like the high clerics of the Church of England. Ah, oh, I'm not done. But anyway, the whole most of it was that they were declaring him the king of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland and all the territories, provinces and so on. <clears throat> and they were also authorizing the British government to use the old seal of Queen Elizabeth II for all official documents until a new seal could be designed and made uh, for King Charles III. In other words, every monarch gets their own seal. So there is probably has been already in the works a seal for King Charles III so that any official government act, act of parliament or any royal letters that come from the king's palace and so on, the king's throne. They are sealed just like we have the great seal. And you don't see it there. You have to see it there. The great seal of the United States of America. That seal goes on treaties. It goes on acts of Congress. It goes on uh, things the president signs and so on. That official seal designates that it has the absolute authority and force of law or treaty. So what this means is if God is sealing his servants, Israel, in their foreheads, it is a now an official act of God that he is putting his official authority over Israel. Who used to be our God? The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's Ephesians 2.2. 2. Who is our God now? No king save King Jesus was what our patriot forefathers used to say. And so our God and our king now is no longer the prince of the power of the air or the prince of darkness. It is God himself. And with his seal in our foreheads, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, it shows to the devil and it shows to the world. You can take their body, 
that you cannot have their soul. Somebody say amen. And it has the force of law because God is a just God. Amen? That was, that was the bell. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the lessons taught today. Father, help us to understand and know our history, to know what things mean. When we see what's going on in the world, Father, there's usually something in the Bible that applies to it, that shows us what's going on, shows us what's happening. And Father, with even though we have no king here in America, Father, our mother country, England, still has a monarch on the throne. And Father, we draw from that in that we know that Jesus is both king even over King Charles. And he's king over us. And as royal and eye-pleasing it is to man to see the crowning of a new monarch in England, what a day it will be when Jesus Christ comes back, as in Revelation 19, riding on a white horse, showing and written to the world that he is both king of kings and Lord of all lords, and that every knee, and it doesn't matter if they are pauper or prince, must bow to Jesus Christ and him alone. Father, we look forward to that day when even the evil angels themselves must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Bless your word. Bless these people. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen, Amen to that.